Good morning, church family. Uh, glad to be with you again today as we do this study on the book of Proverbs. Hope you and your family are doing well, and we always invite you to go to our website, SaturnRoad.org, to get the latest information about our church and uh, what we're doing during this, uh, this pandemic. Uh, we are canceling all of our activities through the, uh, probably through the end of the month, but just stay in touch with that website. I want to start today by asking you a question. Um, which is most important, believing and understanding correct doctrine and theology or living a life that's obedient and pleasing to God? It sounds like one of those questions that guys with too many letters after their name who sit around and, and uh, drink coffee and have these hour-long discussions about those kind of questions, maybe they'll write a book or a paper on it. But for most of us, we're, gonna, uh, we're people who would say doctrine and theology is very, very important. But I hope as we go through this study of the book of Proverbs, we'll understand that there really is no difference in those questions, that God looks at both of those the same way. As we start into chapter 9 that Kevin started with us uh, earlier uh, this week, we're going to start seeing Proverbs look more like I remember them looking, just a series of short little advice, short little sayings, maybe even random saying, sayings, clever ideas to help us gain wisdom. This advice and this wisdom helps us uh, in our relationship with God and help us in our relationship with each other. But even in these random proverbs, I have found several key ideas that keep coming back over and over again. One is personal relationships are important. Number two, pride and arrogance are the enemy of wisdom. And pride and arrogance often control my mouth and what I say, and that gets me into trouble sometimes. And our attitude towards wealth is key to our understanding of God. But what I want us to understand in these seemingly random Proverbs is this. God cares about, God has an interest in all aspects of my life, not just my religious life, not just what I do here at church. And therefore, there is no difference in God's mind between doctrine and theology and how I live out my life before others in this world. One must have an impact on the other. Both are essential. I don't have a church life and then a separate religion and a religious life that's separate from my secular life. But it's easy for us to fall into that trap. Someone said that our lives are much like an iceberg. And if you've ever seen an iceberg or a picture of an iceberg, 20% of us show on top of the water. And the 80% 80 80 is below unseen. The 20% that you see above the water is, could be my church life, my Bible class life, and our fellowship. In my 20%, I look pretty good. I, I talk the right talk. I believe the right things. I say the right things. I believe the right things about salvation and even maybe about worship. But then there's the 80% that you don't see, that's the 80% that's below the surface. That's my thoughts and my attitudes and my desires and my struggle with sin. My life away from you is my church family, my life at home, my life in my business, in my life in my community. That's the 80% that you don't really get to see very much. And as you look at these Proverbs, and as you look at Jesus' Proverbs in the Sermon on the Mount, you're gonna see that most of the teachings in both of these books deal with the 80% that you don't really see. The emphasis is on how we treat other people in my relationships and my honesty and my attitudes. Very little of the Proverbs and very little of Christ's teaching have to do with doctrine to the exclusion of my daily living. Several months ago in my Sunday morning Bible class, we studied a book called The Life You Always Wanted by John Ortberg. He tells a story about a church, and in that church is a member named Hank. And Hank is described as the guy who never changed. Hank had been a member of that church for over 40 years. And Hank was always there. He was always there when the doors were open, as my parents would like to say. He always put a check in the contribution plate. He believed the right things, he looked at the right things, his salvation and about worship and salvation. But Hank was the meanest man in the church. He was an angry, miserable young man, and now he was an angry, miserable old man. And Ortberg makes the point that they never called a special elders meeting about Hank. They never had a special prayer vigil about Hank because really most of us don't really expect people to change. We don't expect our doctrine and theology, the things we study from the Word of God and the Holy Spirit in our life, to change our behavior much. And that's a sad thing. We don't expect that doctrine and beliefs about theology ever change my non-religious life. I hope that after we study this, these books of, these chapters of the book of Proverbs, 
that we'll get a better understanding on that. Today we're going to be in Proverbs the 11th chapter, and we're going to see that there is no compartmentalization in my life, that God wants it all. So let's dive into Proverbs 11. I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the humble is wisdom. The integrity of the upright guides them, but the crookedness of the treacherous destroy them. Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. The righteousness of the blameless keeps them their way straight, but the wicked falls by his own wickedness. I'm going to read that to you again out of the Good News Translation. It says, The Lord hates people who use dishonest scales. He is happy with honest weights. People who are proud will soon be disgraced. It is wiser to be modest. If you're good, you're guided by honesty. People who can't be trusted are destroyed by their own dishonesty. Riches will do you no good on the day of your death, but honesty can save your life. Honesty makes a good person's life easier, but the wicked will cause their own downfall. He talks in here in Proverbs, Solomon talks about a dishonest weight or false balance or uh, a dishonest scale. Read a story some time ago about two gentlemen that lived in a little village. One was the village baker and the other was the village dairyman. He provided the milk and eggs and butter and cheese for the village. The other was the baker. And at one point in their relationship, the baker took the dairyman to court. Uh, and the basis of his suit was that he thought that the dairyman had been cheating him on how much a pound of butter was. He made the case that years ago, a pound of butter looked a lot larger than it was these days. And so he took him to court and he puts the dairyman on the stand and makes the accusation that he's not really getting a full pound of butter for his money. And the judge asked the dairyman for an explanation. And the dairyman says, well, I love this man so much and I honor him so much. I always treat him with proper respect. And the way that I measure his butter is I take a pound of his dough that he sells me the dough of his bread, I take a pound of that and put it on the balance and I weigh the butter by his own weight of one pound of bread. The judge looked at the baker and dismissed the case. It's easy to be like the baker who um, finds ways to scrimp, finds ways to maybe even cheat on our own, uh, in our own life, but we look at other people's lives with, a, with a, maybe a different lens. Um, dishonest scales, dishonest business dealings. It's uh, easy to beat up on a guy like the baker. We all have temptations to tip the scale in our own favor, temptations to let things slide toward our own benefit um, because we say maybe it really doesn't matter that much. No one will ever know. I think the language is interesting here in Proverbs that God calls dishonest scales an abomination. That is strong, strong language. And abominations is a serious word. When I think about abominations in the word of God, I see it describing idolatry and chasing after other gods. In Deuteronomy, it lists sorcery and witchcraft and all those big sexual sins that we don't really want to talk about much. Those are things that are abomination to God, and I understand that. But why would God call something like just using a dishonest scale an abomination? Maybe it's because the guy who's using the dishonest scales took advantage of those who at least could defend themselves. Maybe he was taking advantage of the less sophisticated or even the poor who would never be able to figure it out. Maybe it's because the, the guy who uses the dishonest scale has some selfishness and pride and thinks of himself first rather than others. And maybe it's because the guy who uses the dishonest scale is greedy and places too much emphasis on getting just a little bit more profit. There's an interesting scripture in Leviticus 19. Almost these same words are used. He says, you shall not do injustice in judgment, in measurement of length, weight, or volume. You shall have honest scales, and honest weights, and an honest ephath, and an honest hen. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe all my statutes and all my judgments and perform them. I am the Lord. It's this same teaching about honest weights and honest measurement and being honest in our business deals. But this time he gives us a reason for that. One is we are honest in our dealings because of who God is and what God has done for us. He says, 
you be honest because I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt. So we, we respond to God in gratitude for what he's done for us. But the better reason that we are honest, he says, because I am. Because I am the Lord your God. He uses that personal name, Yahweh, there. I want you to be honest in your business dealings with others because I am your God. Because I, of my character, because of my integrity, I want you to be the same as me. And that's what God says in Leviticus 19. Kevin did a great job when he was talking about chapter 9 a couple of days ago. It's particularly in verse 10, he talked about the fear of God and what that means. And Kevin made a good point that the fear of God is not like being afraid of God, but it's being in awe of God, and being respectful of God and who God is. We kind of overuse that word awe when we use the word awesome so much these days. What are you in awe of? If we're in awe of God and who he is and his character and his, his presence, then we will behave differently and we'll behave honestly. Solomon says that we are to be honest in our dealings and we are to be honest because of who God is. Honesty doesn't come from myself, it comes from God's character. There's another word I want to share with you in this, in this proverb. In chapter 11, verse 3, it says, The integrity of the unright guides them, but the crookedness of the treacherous destroys them. I like that word integrity. It's important. What does the word integrity mean to you? It comes from the word integer. If you're doing home by, uh, math studies with your kids this week, you need to pay attention to this. They may ask you on the test what an integer is. An integer is a whole number. It's closely associated with the, the number one. It cannot be divided. It's not a fraction. It's often associated with that number one. Wholeness and unity and oneness. That's a beautiful concept about integrity. But it's important for us to know who we are one with and who we are, uh, have integrity with, and that is Jehovah God. My integrity does not come from myself or my own character or motivation. If I do that, I'll cheat you on the butter. But when I have such awe and such love and appreciation because of the character and nature of God, then I'm honest because he is honest. I have integrity because God has integrity. The 20% of my iceberg above the water is the same as the 80% of my iceberg below the water. My theology of God and the outcome of my life, they're one. They are not different. They're consistent. They, are, they have integrity. That's why that question about which is more important, theology or doctrine, or the quality of my life is really no question at all. If my beliefs and my convictions about God, that's my theology, does not affect the outcome of my life in the real world, my interaction with you, then my theology is flawed and my theology is nothing. Someone said it this way, the church's integrity problem is the misconception that we can add Christ to our lives but not subtract sin. It is a change in belief without a change in behavior. Look at the, uh, Proverbs 11, verse 18. He says, the wicked earns deceptive wages, but the one who sows righteousness gets a sure reward. Honest work for honest wages. That's what my dad always told me. Colossians 3 says that we, when we are working for wages, we're really working for Christ. There is no separation from my church life and my career and my job. I am a good employee. I'm a good boss because I have awe and respect for God. I am working for him. Proverbs 11 verse 26 says, the people curse him who holds back grain, but blessings is on the head of one who sells. Today, our modern day version of that would be don't hoard the toilet paper. If you're a merchant, don't take advantage of people. If you are to be a seller, be a generous seller. If you sell your merchandise, sell it with integrity. One of the things I've come to really appreciate in this proverb study about Solomon is that he uses contrast to prove out what it, wisdom and integrity are. The wicked do this, but the wise do this. Listen to Proverbs 11, verse 4. Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. The message translation of that verse says this. A thick bankroll is no help when life falls apart, but a principled life can stand up in the worst of times. Boy, isn't that amazing? Uh, isn't that a, a beautiful verse for us today? A principal life can stand up to the worst of times. You think it's just a coincidence that Proverbs and Solomon talk so much about money and wealth in this context about wisdom? Listen to Proverbs 11, verse 7. When the wicked dies, his hope will perish, 
and the expectation of wealth perishes too. That's the scripture we use when we talk about there are no U-Haul trailers behind the hearse. All the expectations of the wealth and the wicked pass away when they pass away. But look at the converse of that in the viewpoint of wisdom in verse 24 and 25. One gives freely yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched and the one who waters himself will be watered. Kevin said this so well the other day in his study on Proverbs 9. Wisdom is available and needed by not just the, the poor but also the, the wealthy. Wisdom is available to both. It is no respecter of wealth. It's our attitude about wealth and the stuff that proves out our wisdom. And if our doctrine and our theology are having any effect on us at all. I heard this, wealth is a gift and not a goal. Wealth is a gift and not a goal. Some of the wisest people I know are very wealthy. And some of the wisest people I know have very little. But they have this in common. They're both very generous with what they have. A little or a lot. Listen to the proverb of Jesus in Matthew 6. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Paul said this through inspiration years later in to Timothy and 2 Timothy, the 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, and to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Be wise in your dealings. Be wise in your business dealings. Be honest in your gaining of wealth and do good with the stuff that you accumulate. Why? Because of God's character, because of who he is. I want to be like him and I want to please him. I want to be united with him. I want to have integrity with him. God says be holy because I am holy. Be honest because I am honest. Be generous because I am generous. It's not just what I believe about God and worship that are so important. It's how I allow my awe and my respect of God to change me and my behavior out there in the real world to reflect and bring honor to God. Proverbs 21 says, to do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than a sacrifice. So, is it important to believe the right doctrine and the right kind of things in, about the Bible? You bet it is. Can I go to the right church and still have an integrity problem? You bet you can. Let's don't make it a choice. Let's get our lives to be in line with our doctrine. Folks, during these stressful days, our integrity is showing and our God is showing. So make sure you don't short somebody a pound of butter this week. And maybe more importantly, share your toilet paper with everybody that's in need. Thank you for listening and thank you for your um, devotion to God. Uh, we appreciate the chance to have these studies with you. Stay in touch with us. We love you very much. God bless.